Boy, that's got the look, I have to admit. I have to take full credit for what Les did. <laughs> that does look good. Now we're going to be ready. We'll flip this over. As soon as you finish that, then put some thin CA on it. Just soak it with thin CA. And we'll be ready to flip this over. We're half done. Oh, we got this, the B-25 airfoil. This is what's going to be on the new Stuka, the uh, Spitfire. Okay. Joe, Adamosco, Joe Adamosco's 90 Spitfire design. This is the airfoil. Nice macho wing. Oh, yeah. Get that blend in so when we flip it the rest of the way, we won't have to do much on the leading edge. Well, this, this stuff is powder and right off. I love it. Nothing worse than when you're trying to sand fiberglass and it turns into chewing gum for you. Where's that? Give me that thick... Oh, I got it. Never mind. I'm already through in a couple of spots yeah, here. Oh, okay, no. Well, go th then just keep doing. Go. Hit the spots where you go through. That seals it right back up like magic. The whole trick to making one of these wings. You're going to have a lot of new friends now that you're in the German Air Force. Yep. Just takes time. And all of this stuff you're taking off is just dead weight. I think you're going to just get this wing sanded today. We're not going to get yeah. it glassed, but uh, I'd rather get it totally sanded and feel like we're one step ahead on this. The way this is coming out so nice. It really is coming out nice. Yeah, just a little radius. We already got it trued up. Just make that radius. All right, so the next session we'll glass the joints. You got the tips roughed out, right? Yeah. Okay. I have to wind the eyes. Wind the eyes, and that's an important thing. Wind the eyes, and you bet. That's one. Too. Don't rich eyes them. Wind the eyes them. That was cute. I remember Don't that. Out of Musco. Yeah, I know. Wind the eyes. That was that was cute. All right, so this was a pretty good session. I got to admit, we're in good shape here. Now I got a little bit of time here tonight, not a lot, but I didn't want to waste it and I thought, well one of the next things I need to do is 
get the flaps trimmed into the shape of the wingtip I need to locate it and what makes this hopefully accurate is I don't have any slop in the horn there's no side slop so this will not be going side to side and I'll just put the hinges in place and then see how much I have out here make sure I've got that blend that I'm looking for that very nice smooth blend into the flaps now to me it's real important to get this this edge here I guess is the right word well, what I'm going to do is just get it on a, a little bit more of an angle than I need just a slight bit of an angle and then blend it in with the block all in one piece and I can cut that last little bit out with the zona saw and dress it off with a sanding block now after I got rid of this now I want to make sure I not only did I have this angle but that I've got the taper equal in both sides that's why I need to do this with the hinges in place and eyeball it as soon as I get this let's call it an edge for lack of a better word and I'm happy that I have the contour then I'll seal this with thin CA get a nice hard edge so it won't be prone to be picking up little dings and little problem areas now because I'm near the end of the wing construction here I want to start getting a finish on a wing so what I need to do is and I guess we'll start doing it tomorrow I need to set up a little because I've reorganized the shop I need to set up a little work table in the back to mix paint on I don't have an area now the lathe is in the area where we used to do that so I'll set up a little card table or something strictly for the paint now the critical thing is here is that it just flows smooth right around the whole edge and I've got the shape the way I want it and as soon as I'm real happy with that the only thing left will be just seal it up with thin CA once that edge is hardened up I'll recheck it make sure I have the contour that I want and I'll just need to go over and do the other one and even just getting a little step like this done late in the day means I'll get a nice fresh start tomorrow and I'm trying to get establish a nice razor edge here right on center but then the final cut I'll make with the part right in place and I'd like to get as much shaping out of wood as I can done before we start the final smooth sanding and the doping I'd like to get that edge nice and straight And all that's left is to get the other one done off camera. We'll end the night on a positive note and get back here early in the morning with a cup of coffee and get ready to start putting the dope finish on this. Well, it's early, early, early. The early worm gets the bird. This is my friend Needle Beak up here. I'm going to get rid of him. I got two needle beaks out there now. You believe this? I like the little birds. Don't like the big birds. Anyway, it's early. It's time to get down to the shop. We're excited about having a uh, pretty good chunk of this day. We'll be able to work on the wing as soon as we get done having our coffee. I don't know why, but that's still one of my favorite favorite pictures. No, I was hoping I'd get a good, a real good session in today. Because once I start doping, and this is going to be the beginning of doping, and, and it's ironic, this is really ironic, that it's the first day we've had ice on the pond. And that's usually a good indicator that building season is here for good. Now, I did a lot of sanding on this wing so far, but most of it is with 220 
The 220 sandpaper does shaping. Now I'm going to do a final, absolute final sanding on this. And it's going to be very labor intensive, take a lot of time. I want to get this perfectly smooth. I also set up a little table that I'm going to uh, just use for mixing paint on since I, I don't want to start mixing paint on my newly organized shop here and make a mess out of things. But this will be my dedicated mixing paint table on and I'll Thanks to Rich Jackabone, we have some nice kimchi jars down there. We're going to be using one to mix up some dope. Some nice coffee cans. But the first thing, the first thing is to get a total, total sand out on this wing with 320. Now from this point in the job on, at least on the wing, ironically too, that we just hit exactly today. Ice on a pond and mixing dope for the first time on this project. This is the paper that, and Rich ran into this the other day. He bought some uh, inexpensive gray paper, or didn't cut at all. This was the stuff that was really cutting really well, I'm not, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just rich. But now I'm taking my, my sanding blocks first of all. Most of this has to get done with sanding blocks, not all. But I'm going to take this part, and these are the blocks that, uh, in fact I need to, uh, this one's got a rip in it. This is how I've been doing this, and it's worked out pretty well. I make up this little part. I was showing Rich how to do this yesterday. So Now you'll notice one side of this block has a relief. It's cut back on an angle so I can get in corners and edges. But I need to have this nice and flat. Now 320 paper usually wears out. I should say wear out. It, gets, it loses its razor cutting edge a lot quicker than 220 so the trick is buy a whole roll it's expensive but it saves a lot of time and effort and the result is well worth it now on this wing there's a lot of things and I try to Dave Downey explained this to me when I was doing a B25 there are focal areas on a plane you look at a plane and it's the first time you've seen it there are eight or ten focal areas the B25 it's the rudders the cockpit the gun turrets and those are the things that had really be perfect. Now in this wing, because we have this curve, this Miss Ashley kind of curve, and this, this airflow right around here, if we were to leave a rough edge in here somewhere or, or octagon it, it's going to really not look the way I'd like it to look. So I did most of the shaping. Not all of it, but most of it, because I still do the final amount with my hand. Bare hand, and when I see I've got a rough spot, thick CA on a paper towel, and blend it in. I also wanted this to be a perfect lineup. This is one of those focal points. And if this is off, and a lot of times when you'd make this part and then you wouldn't have the horn attached, you'd get out here and this is off by a 64th of an inch and you could see it. So what I've done as the final answer is just every time I'm sanding this, put it back in place and do the final sanding that way. I want the flaps to line up as well as I possibly can. Now luckily this mold, as an example, this mold, let me take this part off, has a center line and our hinge pockets are plenty big that if in the final analysis we need to move one of these we can just shove a little piece of I don't even know, 64th plywood I guess, if one of these hinge pockets got sloppy but I wanted them to fit and not pucker or wood but I want I turn them over I don't want them to fall out either so it's it's kind of a clearance thing but now it's this surface here, and I'll start with this, because what I'm going to do is sand this, then put it back in place. Sand this, put it back in place, and then at the end, sand the whole thing at once. It's this surface here that I want to get as smooth as possible. And this will take time. This will take me an hour or so to sand out the whole wing, but then we'll be ready for that first coat of dope. And that first coat of dope... That's the coat of dope that's going to bond the finish to the wood. So that first coat is a critical coat. And because we have the heat on in the house now, oh yeah, now I can feel just how smooth that is relative to where we were sanding with 220. But I don't want to lose the shape. I want this shape to be, because I've worked on this shape for quite a while. I want all that as if everything were flowing off that tip. And the tips on the Testarossa and Miss Ashley, I thought, were one of the more attractive things. Of course, that's all in the eye of the beholder. 
But once that's velvety smooth to the hand, now I have to basically do that to the whole wing, and then I'm ready for the first coat of dope. But, but this is a part, I don't want to rush this through and be done in 10 minutes. I want to get a cup of coffee, relax, get myself comfortable because this is, this is going to make or break the finish. Now, any high spot that I leave up here now, if I were to leave a chunk, a high spot, anything that I start putting the dope finish on is going to be a repair. I want to minimize the amount of repairs. I don't want to have that, that half of the plane is, is red lead primer and all kind of things like that. I'd like it to be as, as smooth. This is the first brick in the wall. Remember that thing we always talked about? The first brick has to be smooth. This is the one also that cuts a lot of the weight off. Because if I leave this first coat, I'm going to have to fill it with filler. If I get this perfectly smooth, I need a lot less material to put on and a lot less to sand off. It's a win-win and the finish is a lot smoother when I'm done. And sometimes I refer back to the original part. The tips on the 90 ship are maybe a quarter inch smaller, but they have the same flow. And I think it's one of the attractive curves. They're not flat. They have a, it's a constant curve. Every angle on here, there's almost no straight line on the whole tip. And that, if it blends right in here nice, I think that really gives it a nice, uh, I don't know, a nice professional aerodynamic look. And that's what I'm after with the, with the 90 ship. Now this is another area that's I want to get absolutely perfect. I don't want to have any lumps here, any edges that aren't perfect, because this edge is going to either be up against the fuselage or part of the fillet, and this joint here is going to show in the final product. So I want that to be, even this edge here, to be perfectly smooth. The other thing is that even at this point, right in the beginning, everywhere there's a sharp edge, as I'm, all, as I'm finished sanding, I want to kiss it. I don't want to have any razor edges. Where do they razor edge? The paint is not going to stick, it's going to bleed through, and then it's going to start to have a tendency to peel in time. So if I get this as smooth as I can get it in every dimension, work in this edge, you can see how the aluminum blended, the tube blended right up into the, that little kerf. If I have a little spot here, right now is a good time to fill it. Lightweight spackle is a good choice if it's a very small, if it's big, I'll use air epoxy light. Where this comes to a radius, I want the whole trailing edge to have an equal radius. And I can do a lot of this with the sanding table, just by holding it down and getting the whole edge at once. This part, especially with 3, 320 doesn't cut real fast, it takes time. I do all the checking with my bare hand, but when this whole thing is done, We'll be ready for our first coat of dope. Now one of the things I thought I'd mention too is from this point on, on this part, I have the, all these old towels. And just towel after towel after towel. Then underneath it there's some sponges, a spongy pad or whatever that is. Oh, that's that stuff from Midgley that uh, we wrapped the mold in. Bleeder cloth. Anyway, here's the whole point. When you get to this point you want to try to avoid dings at all costs. Well, this is a soft table. Nice and soft. Also, before I start sanding apart, I'll rub my hand on here to try to find any spot where a little drop of CA or epoxy has made a little mountain or a little, in fact, you got one right down there. I'm going to cut it off. When I find such a thing, well, there's one right here. I can show you what, what's happened is I cut a hole. I just cut that part out with a scissor. Now, the reason is, I don't want, in fact, this one here is pretty ratty looking. I don't want to have any CA dropping down into my final product where I'm going to have a smooth. This I want to make sure is perfectly smooth. Then I can take my part, whatever part it is, the wing, the flap, tail, whatever I'm working on, and I've got a nice smooth surface. Now, two things happen. The dust, a lot of the dust I should say, not all of it. It's hard to do this by the sanding bench because of the way the shop is set up. But a lot of this dust will get caught up, this fine dust now, from 320 down. And you could use 400 if you wanted to. I found 320 to be just about as good as, as I can uh, realistically get it at this point. But this has to be velvety smooth and velvety flat and have no edges that I'm going to want to bury, or as few as possible. 
Now, that dust seems to float down into this towel. So what I can do at the end of the session, carefully fold this up, take it outside, shake it, or in the best of all worlds, since I do the laundry in this house, I just throw it in with the, the laundry. That dust doesn't bother anything. I do the towel separate anyway. What a good housewife I am, by the way. So, so getting that done, by the time I wash it and dry it, less than an hour is gone by hour and a half. I've got clean towels for the next session, and I'm not breathing all this dust all the time. I've noticed another thing, and I thought I'd mention this. It's, it's usually at this point in time, and I've worked with a lot of people, one of the criticisms I have of Rich Jacobone is he gets to this point, and he's so excited, and I understand that, he wants to get it done, get it done. And he tends to skip over some of these steps. And what I'm going to try to do in, in the course of our videos, the subscriber videos, is try to cover every step. Because even leaving out one of these steps, what happens is when you leave a step out in the first row of bricks, when you leave a crooked brick, you make yourself twice the work here, three times the work, and in the end, you've got a part that you're constantly trying to correct. Where if you do all the correction and all the flat sanding now and get it velvety, velvety smooth, and then in that first coat of dope, when that first coat of dope goes on, and it's got a, I'm going to put a little extra retarder in it, I want to get a good bond. I want to get a bond into this. That is extremely important that that first coat go on wet. And we're gonna, we'll go over that when it's time to mix the, mix the, uh, the material for this plane. But one of the things is try to convince yourself that when you're doing this sand out, this sanding of the raw wood for the last time, you right now, and, and I don't care how long this takes because this is, this is the first row of bricks. Now that really was labor intensive to get that as flat as I could. It's as flat as it can be right now, but the next step on this, the next step is going to be to mix up the first coat of dough. I may as well just do a little storyboard on this just to show it in. This, this is the kind of thing that it's difficult to explain to people how critical this is. But once you get this right, this is that foundation. And from this point on, if you have this part right, it just goes very, very nicely. And it's not frustrating. So I want to make up a batch. And this is just common 101 finishing technology. If I had some dope left over from last year, this is not when I'd want to use it up. I can use it up in filler coat probably more effectively. But what I want to do now is take, get one of those kimchi jars or a coffee can. Usually a quart gets me started. Quarter Brodac clear. What a Brodac thinner. That's 50-50. And about, in this case, about 20% retarder. Now, why the retarder? When the, when the heat is on in this house, we usually don't have a problem with that. But that retarder serves to slow down the dry time. And in our case, one of the things we want to get is the bond. And as that material is drying, it's creating a bond with the wood. So this is always a good little trick. And 20% seems to be about right. Not, it's not a critical thing. It's not, I put a little bit less, a little bit more. So I always like to start with, this would be my first mix. Now what I'm going to use this for, not only on a wing, but on other parts, this is the bond coat. This is wood. This will be relatively thin, and I'll need extra. See, what's going to happen is I'm going to need extra on this. Because when I go to do the wood, here's what's going to happen. I want this to penetrate down into the wood. Take its time to dry. Take overnight to dry. I don't want to put this up by a heating vent. I want this to really soak in and create a bond. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to ultimately put on maybe two or three coats, sand this down, get this smooth again go through what I went through this morning then put another coat on but all the while I'll be using this this mix this first base coat mix and I'll call that my base coat mix once I get the bonded surface that I want and it's really smooth it'll be ready for tissue but but it's already got 
the penetration down into the wood cells because I've added a little bit of retarder. It just makes it a little bit easier, a little bit better. Now especially, and absolutely especially on that first couple of coats that are going to hold the tissue down. So we're going to mix this up right now. And we should be ready. Uh, well, I, li I like to always have the material ready as soon as possible so that when I get an hour of time, because from this point in the day on, or this session on, what I need to always account for is my dry time. In other words, if I put a coat on, then I can do go do some shop work, come back typically three or four hours later, it's ready, sometimes sooner if the heat is up. Karen usually wants the heat up. When I'm here, it's a little cooler, so it takes longer, but I wouldn't want to do it ten minutes later. What I'm saying is my minimum would be probably two hours for the next coat. Two hours for the next coat, otherwise you're just trapping thinner down in there. But I want to start spacing out the day, and it's that time management thing. Put a coat on, have something to do while it's drying. Coat on while it's drying. Now, at some point in time, I'm going to want this to dry. I'm going to come down in the morning, put on a coat of whatever filler, whatever, and I'm going to want it to dry for the rest of the day. And when that, when that day comes, when that time comes, then I start working on the top block. So I'm not losing time all along the way. And if you use the time management, you wind up getting twice as much done, or it just becomes a lot easier to do. When you squander it away, the worst scenario I remember is, not mention any names, I go over to have a work session, and the first thing of the day is you put on a coat of dope. Now it's cold, there's retarder in it, it takes six hours to dry. Guess what? you lost five and a half hours of that day because you can't work on it unless you have another part to work on. So we always try to plan this that we're working on two, three, or four projects at the same time so, so we're not prone to rush the dry time. And that's, that's a real high risk thing to be rushing the dry time. Now whenever I make up a batch of material in this case, I want to identify what's in this jar because I've, I basically last year used up most or all of my old paint. So here we are, starting a new year, a new finish right from the get-go, and I want to go through my mixing routine, 50-50, add about 20% of retarder, but I want to know what the hell is in here. I don't want to get to, you know, have six jars, and especially when some are clear, some have retarder, some have no retarder, some are spray brush consistency, spray consistency, and, and I don't want to have that. And I want this to be all brand new material too. This is the bond coat. This is the one that's going to hold the finish to the wood. Now I know what's in the jar. I got the mix that I'm looking for. Looks like my brush cleaner is down to the end and what I usually use is just some, some of the old last year's thinner so I can clean a brush and now a little thing about brushes this brush looks pretty ratty after all these years you know what had happened is Ed Gallagher and it was when we were first experimenting with molding in the let's say 96 97 window he told me to get a squirrel head a squirrel hair brush at an art supply store I went down looked at him twenty seven dollars holy mackerel but here it is 10 years later and I'm still using the same, it looks like a ratty brush. In the last year or so it started to use a, lose a few hairs up till then. It was just absolutely bulletproof. But this is one of several brushes that I really like. Go to an artist supply store, squirrel head brush. And we're ready to put our first coat of dope on. Now it goes without saying that every bit of material that we're going to put on paint the paintwork here will be all Brodac. We're not substituting thinners for uh, Home Depot thinners or Lowe's thinners or whatever. And we want to try to avoid any possibility that we're going to be adding a ton of work to our finishing process. If you do a standard dope finish the traditional way, it's a lot of work, but if you don't invent anything, it usually comes out pretty good and it's always light and it adds an incredible amount of strength. Now all the sanding is done, we're ready to get some dope on this wing and I'm excited about it. But before I put the first drop of dope on these parts, 
I want to weigh up the wing, the flaps, and the hinges and get a gram weight. Now I always keep a gram weight of every part in raw wood and up to the paint. In fact, I know what the finish is on these, hopefully, and uh, the buff paint and all this. And if anybody uh, would like to copy this, just put your put your VCR or whatever on uh, stop and make a copy. But that's what the Testarossa weighed. Now we do this for every plane, of course. And we're going to start our database now for the 90 ship. Okay, now don't forget, I've got the wing, the flaps, the hinges, ready for the first coat of dope, the horn, all the associated hatches and tip weight box cover, everything on there. In raw wood, it's 415 grams, that's 14.8 ounces, but we have to deduct for the half ounce of tip weight, that's the aggregate of the difference, brings us to 401 or 14.3, ready for dope. Now it's always good, now as I put the dope on in the tissue and whatever, I'll keep recording silver, how much silver added, how much the dope added the tissue, and at the end, this page will go into my database. And I can start to see if the plane is getting too heavy, too not heavy enough, getting too light, or whatever. Now it's just ironic, Joe called before and we were talking about the new spit and what some of the tentative weights on a wing should be and some of the fuselage parts what they should weigh well isn't it handy that we have all that information in a database now it's this first coat that I want to get on super super wet I want this to really soak in it's this coat that's actually going to make the bond And what I usually do is let this dry an hour. With the heat that's in the house right now, the furnace is cranking away because it's cold. An hour from now, I'll get another coat on. I want to put an extra coat on all the wingtips because these don't have a glass. So these, I want two extra coats of dope on. So what I'll do is do this: the raw areas, raw wood areas first. The trailing edge isn't glassed. But the, if you put this on at 50-50, sometimes you don't get a good bond. You need that extra 20% of retarder in there. And you just got to just don't worry about the time it's going to take for it to dry. But we'll get all the parts. I do the flaps, the tip weight boxes, all that separate. A nice, what I would call a wet coat. Now I always use all of my little hatches and flaps and things as a way to test that I have enough material on here. And this is the third coat, so usually three coats will be enough that, that'll be ready for tissue once this dries up. And again, what speeds this up is that we have the heat on in the house and it's really dry here, but if in doubt, just let it dry overnight. And the test is just to get a little bit of a shine on each part, just enough shine. Now, we don't need a shine on a wing where it's fiberglass. Just, just a minimum amount of dope on there, one or two coats is plenty. But where the tips are and a trailing edge where it's raw wood, I need to have at least three good coats, three good wet coats on there. You know, we've got enough dope on everything here and we're just waiting for the heating vent to dry it up but while I'm waiting I'm gonna do my smaller parts I can get the tissue on the smaller parts and again if you have the heat on in the house air heat this stuff just dries up beautifully and it reminds me of the old days when you'd have other brands of material you'd, it was overnight dry for every coat not Brodac dope the work goes quickly Okay, so the first thing, SGM002, medium silk span, all medium silk span. I'll cut up a couple of pieces. I'm 
I, I like to use Windex because it just evaporates quicker, doesn't penetrate into the wood. We've got three coats on here now. Just a little bit of a shine. I don't know if you can see there's just a little bit of a shine on the part. Now the whole trick with all tissue, the thing that, that separates a really good job from a mediocre job is to get enough dope under the tissue at the time you put it on. So I try to get on what amounts, what amounts to be a relatively thick wet coat, whether it's a little part or a big part. The tissue always wet. It's damp, but it's not soaking wet. It's laying on a towel, so any extra can just get patted down. Once I get the tissue to lay down, you can wipe the, any wrinkles that might be on there barehanded. I like bare hands even though probably you could wear a rubber glove if it bothered you to get some dope on your hands. Again, while it's like this, soak it. This is creating that bond. It's going down, softening up the dope that's underneath it. There's three coats of dope. It's been sanded again. Now, right now, that should have a real wet look to it. It should be wet. Now, when it comes time to do the bigger parts, you could trim this off right now, or in our case, one other step. I like to take my hands and just press. Once the material starts to set up, pull out any wrinkles, press the material down. And it takes about a minute and you see what will happen is the material starts to go down. You're forcing it down through the tissue and you're getting a very thin, I guess a skim coat is the right word, of material. Now once that dries, Trimming off the edges of the tissue, your piece of cake. Now this part, it looks like, and it might be that this is a very soft block. It really doesn't have a little shine on it yet. So, and I want to, I want to do all the little parts first before I do the, the wing. So this is real easy. This won't be a problem at all. I'll get a nice big thick coat on there. Really lay it on. Let it just sit a minute or two, but I want plenty on there. And while that's drying, I can just take my tissue, cut the piece up. Just spritz it with Windex. It doesn't have to get soaked. And turn it on a towel, blot it out. Now because it's warm in here, it's 70 degrees, this is already getting tacky. But to have enough under there, where people have, the biggest common problem you can have is not to have enough dope between the tissue and the wood. And then you pull up the tape and sh up it comes. Again, the same technique, whether it's a little part or a big part. Just pressing that down into what now is relatively sticky. Grab some more. This is where it's nice to have a little retarder in the material because it gives you a little extra work time. Without retarder, if you just have a 50-50 mix, this tends to kick, kick off too quickly. Bare hand, press the part down, work from the middle out if there's any wrinkles. SGM002 is really a nice material to work with. If you think, and, and it could be that using lighter silk span will make for a lighter finish. Any of the times I've tried to use lightweight silk span, it hasn't really been productive. And what happens is it'll just I'll just get go through in spots and all the touch-ups I don't think equal the medium grade silk span. So over the years I've kind of come to the conclusion that medium grade is the way to go. Now, because we had I know there's just a little bit of dope less than what would be optimum here. I've got that drawn out and I'll just lay a coat on here and let it sit there for an hour. That little bit of retarder that's in there, that 20%, that's going to just penetrate. When I come back to this in a couple hours, I can just razor it off. And tomorrow I'll be ready to sand. Put a couple more coats on. I can put probably three coats on before I want to sand it. Two to three coats, but I can do them two, three hours apart. So actually in one day, 
if it's a full day like a Saturday or a Sunday, I can get a good chunk of the finishing done. Now when it comes to doing a flap, a couple little tricks. If you, if you look at a flap, it's pretty straight. You know for sure, once you dope one side, it's going to become a banana. So the idea is to try to keep both sides wet at the same time. So the trick would be, at least the way I've done this, and it's, it's a good way to work on any flap, get two pieces of tissue and the trick is to get one side done and flip it right over and do the other side while one side's drying so for that reason alone we're probably going to want to make the tissue just a little wetter than normal with the Windex and again it doesn't have to be soaked because whatever extra is going to happen is going to go right down into the towels If I pick that up and drop it back down, any extra is going to go down into the towels, hopefully. Now I've got that ready. Now the trick is get my material ready. Now I want to get this as wet as possible. I really want this wet because it's been sanded again and it's had an extra coat on but I can't put too much on because what will happen is anything extra is just going to come right up to the top and I really want to have both sides wet at the same time so if I put a thin coat on it's going to start to dry get some in the hinge pockets as soon as I have it wet Now, even though we have wrinkles, we can pull them out. This is a nice time if you have a helper, but if you don't, we got to learn to work. We got to go to go to war with the army we have here. Now that side is soaking wet, and if you were to look at this flap right now, it's probably going to have a bow in it. Now, if you can see the bow, it's got a nice bow in it. Well, it's because one side is wet, one is dry. Same reason your door doesn't shut on a, on a wet day. But I want to get this side attached. So rather than fooling around, if you're doing an I-beam wing, a D tube wing, anything where you have tissue shrinking, good idea to get both sides wet at the same time. Now in my case, I just take my bare hands, press it right down around the front where the hinges go. Once that shows any sign of being attached. Now, because I'm doing two sides at once, I do want to trim this. Brand new razor. I don't need to get fancy or cute, I just want to get the extra off. It'll just make neater, the job neater when I get to do the other side. Boy, it's hard to describe how psyched Joe is about the, uh, the 90 Spitfire project. We've been having these regular phone calls about it, and I guess I'm psyched up too. But we're going to learn a lot from this ship about the vertical CG and the force arrangements. And i got to put this on video right now. Doran has shipped the prop moles, so we'll be able to over the winter time here. Mold up some props and give you an idea of what's involved in molding a prop if you've never seen one. These can go in. And we really do like working with Doran. He's got some cool stuff going on. Looking forward to uh, seeing if I can come up with anything better in the way he's molding his props. If I can't, it's no big deal because the ones we've been using seem pretty good anyway. We have all that toe that we picked up in New Hampshire. I just want to get these parts to stick down. 
before the part dries. Now see, this side is still wet. You can see the bow in it. It totally bows it out. Used to, used to make people panic. Well, no reason to panic. The trick is, get this side wet, same way. How it will be a joy when we do Rich's Stuka. I'm just thinking about something. We're going to be going to have to do that in pieces. Any tissue drop, don't be afraid to get the tissue wet. Once this part is tissued on both sides, then what happens is we re-wet it and put it aside with hopefully both sides drying relatively equally. Oh, I'm hoping once I get these parts, I may get everything tissued here today. Boy, that's going to be nice. You know, as these parts dry, that bowl will come right out. But now, the last step on this whole thing, to get the whole thing wet at once. That's that's the real, I don't know what if you call it a trick or a tip or whatever. Get a nice coat on. And then this coat is gonna dry overnight. Hopefully we've got both sides wet and they're going to dry equally at the same time under the same tension. And one thing never ever do is dope one and tissue one side of a flap and put it aside to dry because it will shrink and then you can't shrink the other side up equally. It'll always be a pain. Anyway. Hope that tip that tip. Hope that tip works well for you. Ready to go. And I'll do the other one off camera. Now the tips, because the tips are the only part of this that's raw wood. They've needed more dope than I thought they would. In fact I want to wet this just a little bit more. All the extra Windex goes out. It's a little bit of an upgrade over just using water, I think. Now, I put a couple extra coats on the raw wood just to make sure we weren't going to have a problem. And now it's time to do the whole wing. And the idea is to get it wet all at once. 
I want to overlap the center about an inch if possible. And again, when you're working alone like this, sometimes it's difficult, not impossible. A good trick if you're working alone, put a little bit of extra retarder, maybe even 25% in there, just so you get extra working time. But you want to get it wet, that's the whole trick. And it looks like if things are going well enough here that we're going to have the tissue all drying up by a heating vent tonight by the time we get to go to bed here. And uh, just spoke to Walt Russell. Walt's building a, uh, a train layout for his grandchildren. I think that's pretty cool. He's supposed to send me some pictures. Okay, now the trick is. When you don't have a helper, this is where you separate the men from the boys. Ugh. Why doesn't somebody just show up now? Wouldn't that be nice? It would be so nice. Now I've got to cut out this little spot in the middle. It's funny, I've had Karen help me do this from time to time. And uh, she's not impressed. And trick, try to get some of the wrinkles out. Not real critical to get every wrinkle out. That's for sure. Now because this is epoxy, not much, actually there's not much chance that we're going to warp this part of the wing, but there's still some. It's still never a good idea to get moisture or humidity around any wood. Nothing good happens, sometimes nothing bad happens, but nothing good ever happens either. Now the middle is going to be doubled, about an inch or two. I just like the extra material in the middle where the fuselage fillet's going to rub. And I'm going to be real careful to wrap this piece around the trailing edge because I want a double tissue to trail. I want one piece to fold over and so where it's doubled, Dave is changing that part in the mold for the next cycle, but it wasn't done for this cycle. It's not done yet. So, I think we're going to try to make a little bit sharper of an edge on there. But it's this part that I want to keep wet. And just like a flap, I know it isn't important on a wing. It's certainly not as important, but I'm going to try to do the same thing. As soon as this part is dry, I'll flip it and do the other side. And I want to wrap this around the trailing edge. And actually, sometimes I get paranoid about all these wrinkles, little wrinkles, they sand right out. And I want this wrapping around, and when I do the top, I want the top wrapping around so that we have double tissue on the trailing edge. Also with the idea in mind, if we do have a weak joint there around a hinge for some reason, we won't get a split or a part coming apart there. Always nice, it's a free lunch thing if you can get a little extra on a, go a quarter inch past the center line on the, the front. That's always nice, because you'll block sand out whatever extra is there anyway. And I guess there's no point putting any more of this on the, uh, on the tape. We just want to get this finished. I'll get the other three panels done off camera.
I just want it to show one. What I'm doing is just rubbing this down. Getting that bond into the into the skin of the wing. So important. And if we can go a quarter quarter inch around in the front. We do that three more times and we're home free all. Now you can see we got it drying right up by the heating vent. And that's going to sit and dry basically overnight. Oh, I'm telling you that. Back to having a smell of dope in the house. This is this is the part of the year that really gets special. Now every year we get a few very unique cards. This one is from Rory Tennyson. Check this out, Ford Tri Motor. Now I suggested to I suggested to Karen that we we get personal Christmas cards like this, and she looks at me and she says, "You're a you're a nutcase." Not happening. She's having dolls on her Christmas cards. Anyway, we enjoy hearing every year from Rory Tennyson. He, and he always sends us some little memorabilia, a little present. We're going to send him our memories DVD just for his enjoyment. And let me show you some of the adventures he's been up to since he's, uh, I guess, been traveling the world. Now, this is a little plastic model. I haven't opened it up. In fact, I won't open this up. I'm going to put this with my collection of stuff. Some of these things... They're better if you leave them in sealed packages. They don't lose parts and stuff. But he knows that I had an air coupe years ago. That, that's a pretty personal gift. Not a neat thing is, just think about this, see? Escala 148, you know what that means? It's 148 scale. means when that's built up, it'll be perfect for Lionel trains. Could be if I build an airport. Now the other thing, he sent me a Lionel train flat car, and I know what that's for. Guess what? We'll put the air coupe on the flat car here eventually. But anyway, look at some of the things he's been up to. It's pretty neat. He's in Tahiti and Bora Bora. I got about a hundred pictures of him all over the world. This is pretty neat. How come you don't ever travel to Rutherford? So obviously Rory's been all over the world here. I'm jealous. Australia. Rory, the thing you want on your resume is, I visited Windy. I mean, you can go all over the world, but unless you've been to Windy's and had pizza on Friday night at Frank's Pizza, I mean, that's like having the Pope kiss your ring. Anyway, some of his models, looks like he's got a collection, and I know from past correspondence and having him check out our videos, He's got a collection of Rory. You need to subscribe to Control Line World. Looks like you got a lot of Control Line stuff here. Looks like he's got an interest in combat too. And what would life be like without a a toolbar? Well, he's got the, those really cool combat props that have one thing of carbon fiber going right through them. And he's got quite a shop here. Quite a collection of combat stuff. Control line world. Combat section. Maybe we can get him to be the columnist. But Rory, we're going to catch you up on our life with a couple of DVDs I think you'll enjoy. What's been going on around here. But we still have your stuff up on a Christmas tree. As I was, as I was trimming a tree, I happened to notice we still have that laser that you sent. Any, some old, look at this, an old T-square kit. Oh man. Nothing quite as nice when you're decorating a tree and coming across a little ornament that somebody's given you years before. It really brings back some good memories. 
Look at this, jet speed boats. Now that's what I call a well equipped shop. Anyway, what we gotta do, R Rory, is get you a DVD camera. So you can shoot some some living stuff on for us. Look at the old props, there's some old stuff there. Look at this one. Anyway, a lot of cool stuff. Anyway, I gotta say that is some shop. Nice eclectic co collection of control line and RC stuff too. Anyway, Rory, thank you so much, and as you can imagine, I hope you enjoy the DVDs we're going to send you, and hope you'll be in touch more often. Now, by looking at the flap, a couple of things, it's as straight as an arrow, as I suspected it would be. And sometime, if it isn't, you can re-wet it. It just means it didn't dry equally, assuming you started off with a straight piece of wood. We have our little gauge, and I can get in all the hinge pockets this way. Now, usually it'll be a tight fit because we've built up some material around the corners. But this helps maintain some nice even corners and on the flat surfaces like the flap I want to use a sanding block. Now to fl this flap, well I only looked at this one so far, looks pretty straight. Also looks pretty flat. Again a flat surface I can use a sanding block. I'm trying to use 320 now. Before I put any more material on, what this does, I call this defuzzing and de-wrinkling. It gets out any of the wrinkles, it gets out any of the fuzz. You could actually, um, sometimes you can hear it. You can certainly feel it. But that, that amount of sanding, that part's ready for another coat. Now, now I'll do the rest of this all off camera, all the flaps and little hatches, until we get to the wing. Now the trick is on areas on the wing, we want to look for wrinkles. First I want to get rid of this. Because we want to dress off the edges every time we sand. But I just love this time of year when it's, it's really cold outside. Believe me, this morning it's ice on the pond time. And that coffee's cooking upstairs. It's, it's a great time to be building. And I guess if I lived in a warm weather climate, I wouldn't be that impressed, but it's nice to be in here. We actually haven't even had any snow this year. But anyway, not yet anyway. Now I wanna feel for my bare hands, just feel. I feel some wrinkles up here. Let's see if I can show them. Right up here there's some wrinkles. And I can work these, but I don't want to go through. I just want to knock the, the tops of the mountains off. And you can see now that where that wrinkle is or used to be, I'm not sure. And all of the edges, I want to break all the edges. Now in the past what I tried to do is go as far as go until I'd start to break through. Well, I don't think that's really overkill. What most important is to get the edges at this point and get these joints. Now if I close my eyes and I can feel that joint, I better work on it. But right now that's pretty decent. So if it's good, it won't need a whole lot and this will defuzz it. 
Again, one of the defining features of this model is the Miss Ashley type tips that just come to a point. They have to come right to a the airflow, right to that point. Anyway, again, I wanted to thank Rory Tennyson, but he is an interesting guy. And every year, it seems like, and we were, this is what's neat about having friends all over the world. I haven't heard from him in a year. I open up a letter, and it's like it was yesterday. So nice to have friends like that. I think that really makes our group a nice special group. And of course, it's only because of DVD that we're able to do some of these sharing of things. Now I'll get this all done. I guess I'll get most of it done off camera, in fact. Because it's just going to be a labor-intensive thing. All the edges, all the flats. I can feel there's a wrinkle right here, a small wrinkle, wherever there's a wrinkle. Spend a little time extra sanding out. And once I want, as soon as I get this all done, then the objective will be to get another coat of dope on this. That coat of dope will seal in all the little loose edges that we have up here now and seal here. And then from that point on, we should have very little sanding between coats. Sometimes I can even put two, three, four coats on at once. But right now, there's still edges. There's still little corners and edges that have to be addressed. So let me get the rest of this done off camera. Now with all sanding done, now the trick is to lay on as smooth a coat as possible. I just want to lay one coat on with as few brush strokes as possible. Sometimes that's easier said than done, by the way. But a lot of times what you can do, if it's a small part, brush in this direction, brush in this direction. And in essence, what you're doing is almost laying it on with as few brush strokes as possible. Not that it's a real big factor now. But the smoother I can get the material on, the better. If it was going on too thick and you're winding up with big glocky brush strokes, put a little thinner in it. But that's about what it should be, what we're looking for right now. And this is the part for me that it just starts to get real nice. Because pretty soon after two or three coats, now what I'm going to try to do here is get on two or three coats, depending on how this is going to dry up and then just put this aside to dry for a day or so. I'll get a coat on, maybe two hours later get another coat, see if it's starting to get... What I want to have is just a little bit of a shine. And then I want to sand it again. But I don't want to get five coats, six coats, get a button before I sand it. The sooner, if I can break through every two or three coats, and if I can get it to dry without brush stroking... Now, yeah, you could do this with spray. The problem is you need about three coats of spray to equal one coat of brush. So the idea of brushing it is just speed things up and get a nice wet coat on there. Now I'll get the flaps and hinges, but the most important thing now is I want to get the little pieces of tissue, I want them to tuck into the hinge pockets just as a way of sealing it up once we put the hinges in. It looks like that's going to be fine. Just get in each one of them before I even coat the part. But we're going to we're going to have to work in the back room today because Karen's home, and I don't I don't like to let too much of the smell of the dope go up into the house. But again, what I'm looking for is a wet, wet, wet coat. Back and forth, back and forth. I'll get all of the parts done, and about a two-hour dry time before I put a second coat on. Now what I'm doing, and this may be something that's appropriate for your shop too, it's really cold out there. It's under, under freezing. we got ice on the pond. The parts are drying up. And what I'm doing, I'm leaving the back door open so that uh, part of the smell or whatever will go out the back and keep Karen from killing me. That's one of the prime things here is to stay alive. But while that's happening, and while this is drying, I have to be aware that instead of a two hour dry time, this is probably going to be more like a four hour because we, we're, the temperature is going to be colder. But also it's a benefit that the fact that it dries and it lets the dope flatten out and lay down.
One thing. Karen gets back from shopping and there's a thousand birds at the feeder. Boy, the birds must like you, baby. Does Karen have good taste in shirts? Now you look at this. this out. Who picked this out? You picked this out. Who picked the bird lovers among us? Yes. And that's all you're getting for Christmas? Is that true? Or is there another gift coming? Oh, there's a nice, <laughs> there's a nice She gift knows. The jeweler. Wait till everybody sees what the jeweler has for my loving bride. I can't wait to get it. We're going to get it this afternoon, too. The Queen of Rutherford. Let me see that shirt. I love that. How come I don't get shirts like this? These are, these are things for the child we adopted. Okay, well, we adopt the child at Christmas time and we're busy buying presents for kids that we don't even have. Not realistically, anyway. Oh, that's okay. She's a poor child. That's okay. As long as I get one of those blouses with the cardinal on it, yeah. I'll be happy. Cardinals? How about getting a shirt with an Oriole on it? Anyway, wait do you see what we got in the mail. Very, very cool. Check this out. Now let me just go back a little bit and tell you a little, a little thing before we show up this little group of pictures that came in the mail today. Walt Russell and I have been friends for many, many years, going back to the first of the Cardinals. And he had built the Cardinal, which I wish he'd send me some pictures of. Now. Walt has since, of course, gone on to Rojet 76s and things like that. But, but we share a lot of things in common. And I thought this is a perfect time to share this. Now, he sent me a set of pictures here. Check this out. He says, oh, you have a Rojet 90. Here's my 76. Here's his test stand, braking stand, whatever. And, of course, there's always a lot of funny little side notes. And it's amazing the things we all seem to share in common. Here's a picture of the work the progress on his bear cat. He's got it in silver and he was going to paint this. In fact, look at the cowl. He was going to paint this with some kind of a custom special paint job and we'll see how that evolves. He sent me some some pictures of his Air Force. Now if you look down close here, you'll notice something. He's got a tiger cat. Now I've got some pictures and of course I love pictures of his shop. I love pictures even like, I, I appreciate the ones that Ramo sent. Here's one of his bear cats. Another picture here of the, uh, of the tiger cat. Now, you know, and it's funny how we all share a lot of things in life. Picture of the tiger cat once it's after it's painted. Another picture of the bear cat. And it's funny how we share things. Now Walt, of course, because we've been sharing videos and sharing pictures and things for God Almighty, it's over 20 years, he knows I like model railroading. And I, I, I'm going to send him some video of the KW Railroad because I know he's building a model railroad in his garage. Now, I know he's building it for his grandchildren, but you know what, Walt? I'll send you some DVDs at a KW Railroad, because I bet your grandchildren will like that. And after I looked at this close, I said, this is a pretty involved railroad. This, we had talked about doing some of the electrical connections on this and how to set it up. And I'm not real experienced about N-Gage, because these, of course, are much smaller, but he apparently has a lot of room. Now, he knows, and, and how, that, what a... Talk about coexisting. Here's the, you could have the train going in and out of the Bearcat here. That's pretty cool. <laughs> he knows I love Rojets. He knows there's nothing quite as good as a Rojet. Not for me, anyway. But anyway, all that aside, I mean, all that is, of course, we're all on the same page. But then he says, and, and this is the part that starts to get, like, a little eerie. He says, I know you like motorcycles. He says, I don't exactly have a Suzuki 1100, but he's got some kind of a, a scooter thing here going on. So here we go. We got motorcycles, model trains, needless to say, all different control line event airplanes and RC planes. And because I've known Wolf for such a long time, he followed pretty much along with us for the whole the whole lifetime that we had Chickie. And of course, when Chickie passed away, 
Walt was very upset too, as many of my friends were. And Walt was, he even offered to buy me another bird, to be honest. And he sent things over the years, bird seeds and stuff for Chicky, but now Walt has had the unfortunate thing of having his wife Beverly pass away recently. And I know one of the things we share is this love of birds. And Walt has gotten a cockatiel. And he's named the cockatiel Beverly. Now I don't know what greater honor there would be. I'm just looking at this. Now, Walt doesn't know this, but early in my life, when I was in my 20s maybe, I had a pair of cockatiels that actually had young, and I had hand-fend young ones. They, they mate and reproduce very, very conveniently. In fact, Brian's got the parakeets. I think Brian's had, over the years, had 20 or 30 young ones. But anyway, Amazing how many things we share in life. And Beverly, you've got a special bond with Chicky here. And we're going to send Walt out some stuff for his grandson. Walt, and, it, and it's, this is the part of what I do that makes it worthwhile. That makes all these late nights, getting up early in the morning and, and running their post office every day. When you have a friend like Walt, it makes it all worthwhile. Walt Russell. And even though he lives on the other coast, we live a coast apart. We, we talk to each other almost every week, share pictures and DVDs. Walt, and we each have tiger cats, we each have model railroads, and now Walt's got Beverly. So I, I expect to see in the future, Walt, maybe a little baby Beverly there. Maybe, maybe you need to get him a, uh, or her, I should say, a mate. These are absolutely phenomenal pets, by the way. You, you just couldn't have a better pet. If, you ha if you're looking to buy a bird, that is, and I, I shouldn't say that while well, Chickie's picture is right on a wall, but they make great pets. Anyway, many thanks, Walt. And look in our box. We got something coming for your grandson. Right, this morning we get a little reprieve from the cold weather. The ice is melted on the pond and it's about 40 degrees, so maybe possible to get another coat of dope on outside. I actually could put some on outside today if the weather holds up the way it is. Because we're planning on trying to schedule a day here to get some more work done on the Stuka. And if I can this morning, I'd like to sand out the wing and maybe get another coat of dope on there. I'd like to get about five coats all together before I put filler. I got three coats on there now. Okay, here's one of the things I look for. Three coats brushed on here. Usually there's some brush marks from doing the striping and whatever, but at this point in time, it's been drying. What I want to do is I want to see if I got all the edges, all the corners, and I want to see if it's not clogging up the sandpaper. Now, if it isn't, I can take a raw piece of 320, a piece like this, just tear a little piece off, to do a test. And the test is, you should always use a brand new piece of sandpaper if you want to do this test, by the way. You don't need a sanding block for this. See, it's powdering off. It means we could sand this out. It's always better if you let it sit an extra day, but because I have this morning waiting for Rich to come over, I'm going to sand it out, and I'll get on another coat. I just want to see how this is going to... See, I want this to be sealed before I put any filler on, and it looks like it will be sealed. It's just going to take me a little bit of time to sand this out, because it's on, this last coat's only been dry in one day. Because this is all round, they don't really need to, all curved, they don't really need to use a sanding block like I would on a flat. Now see, once you start cutting through, and you need to know, you need to cut through with a new piece of sandpaper. But if the sandpaper were to have all little chewing gum spots, you know you got to wait. Or it would be easier to wait. And the flaps have stayed perfectly straight, in fact... 
after the tissue dries and after this shrinks up, I think we're going to have a good set of flaps here, thanks to Elliot. Now just one other thing is, every time I'm painting this, the paint on, <clears throat> on both the box and on the tip weight, the little cover is building up. So I want to kind of keep monitoring that and keep these edges nice and straight. And it's all these little details that in the end add up to just having one of these, what I think is a super detailed finish. This is one of the critical things that, and people that have gone from, I, I don't know, I guess basic finish to very advanced finish, the first thing they realize it's always in the edges that when you hold, when you grab, <coughs> excuse me, when you grab a plane, hold a plane, you feel the edges, leading edge, trailing edge, where the tips blend in. And we're spending an awful lot of time to get those little details right. Now, a lot of times where these tips blend in, because I've done all the shaping, the shape is right now, but now I'm doing finishing. I don't want to reshape this. I've got the shape pretty much that I want to have in there. But I want to do most of, or as much as possible with, a sanding block on a flat, because a flat will make like a nice mirror image. As, as the light goes through there, it'll reflect one time, like a diamond does. And if I sand this by hand, eh, yeah, maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't, but what ensures that you'll have these nice flats is when you have flat areas, flat areas like this, because right now we're still in the what amounts to be the substrate of the finish. And it's real important right now to get whatever's not flat, flat, before we even go into filler coats. And I really don't have enough material on here yet to sand it wet. Another thing too that I've seen some people do is at this point in time they start sanding with 600 sandpaper. Well, it doesn't, doesn't hurt, but it doesn't do any good either because you're not, you're just spending longer than you have to. I just found that right up to filler coat, 320 is the, the best choice for me anyway. And if, if you're doing some, some areas that need to be shaped and gone over, over and over again, maybe 220. But 320 is a good compromise. Let's you get the work done. Let's you get the surface flattened out. In fact, if it warms up any more out there today, what we'll try to do is, because it's warm outside and it's an unexpectedly warm day, once we have this sanded out, maybe we'll spray a coat of clear on. Now, you do save some brush strokes. That's one nice thing. See how nice this is powdering off, by the way? That's, that's the test right there. And if you understand how that test works, there, it kind of makes sense how you go forward on a finishing job. But... But if we were to spray all the coats, what it mean? We need 15 coats. See, that's the problem. But, but in a case like this, if this is really, and it looks like this is really starting to flatten out, and, and it warms up to 50 or so degrees, we'll get one coat sprayed on. Now here's an example of, you can see a, a piece where there's dry areas. See this area in the middle is dry, it needs more dope. So when I do go to put these, when I do go to put the next coat on, I'll do these first. Spray everything else or brush everything else as the case may be. We'll see how the day pans out. A lot of days, a lot of times a day like today, it doesn't warm up. So anyway, but I'll get the, any parts that are dry. Spray the dry part first, put the coat on and come back and put another coat on. So I'll build this up a little quicker. I see it's because we've got, this, this part just has a little bit of a curvature in it and maybe what I can do is just just a thought before I even go and start sanding on the wing or anything maybe I can go just brush on an extra coat on this because this looks like it had a horrible dry spot right in the middle so that the trick is always to be looking out for dry spots and touch them up as soon as possible in other words here's the thing if if it's a part like this you can just respray, rebrush the whole part. But if you have a wing panel and out in the corner there's a dry spot and you have clear in a gun, even if it's real cold out, you can just go just touch that spot up to get rid of dry spots before you put any filler on. Then what it does, it allows you when you put the filler on to get it all out except the, the little spots that are in the little valleys. It's, it's a concept of how to do it 
And one of the goals we have here, on the Testarossa, we had a 6.9 ounce finish. And that was right to the gram weight. Now, we'd like to keep this under 7 ounces. But it's a lot of work to do that. If, if you were willing to take a 10 ounce finish, you can decoupage away. Put a lot more clear on or whatever. But, but we're really shooting for that around 7, maybe 8 the heaviest ounce finish. And when you do that, everything has to be, at this point in time, has to be flat. It can't be that you're filling everything in with filler coat, bondo, talc. That, that finish has to be just like a coat of saran wrap going around the port. You can see we just have the slightest little bit of gloss on this. But if I take my hand, even before I sand this, and I put, put my hand over that, wow, I can't feel anything. I can't even tell what, if I close my eyes, I don't even know where that joint is which was one of our goals. But now I want to keep it. But, but this part here is curved, so I can only go out with the sanding block a certain distance. Then that last little bit I'm going to have to do with either a soft block, and I do have a soft block, and I wanted to just show this as one of the choices. Oh, that's nice. Now, a soft block would be And I just want to show, this is just another one of the ways of, you can get in curved edges here. And it's always good to see what kind of sanding blocks are going to work. Some people prefer doing it, you know, their own unique little way, but this is a way that's worked for me. These are real old school body shop techniques using a soft block, a hard block. If you were painting a motorcycle, a car, a hot rod, not much would change. So once I get everything sanded, I think, in fact, you know what, I, I think the goal is going to be today is just to get this whole thing sanded out. I'm going to set up the spray gun and spray on a light coat of clear. And then, well that can be dry in while Rich is here. and. I know he's excited. I, I want to get his project. We got to do the glassing on his project when he does get here. But I'll have a couple hours in the morning here to work on this. Get this coat sprayed and we'll come back to this. We'll let it sit up by the heating vent and work on it some more tomorrow. But getting the sanding done, now I can do this. This, this I don't need to sand it like it's a buff out job, but just knock down any little high spots and constantly using my hand to find spots that I'm not happy with and correct them. Now, because of the way this sanded out, I mean, this, this just sanded out beyond my wildest expectations. And what I thought I'd try to do, because, see, first of all, the wing, except for the wing tips, has already been fiberglass, so we really don't need a lot of filler, if any. So, what I thought I'd do here is, I'm going to finish sanding this up, and it looks like I'll have time. And because it isn't, it's 50 degrees out there already, what it's going to allow me to do, I'm going to put on one more coat of clear. I normally would put two. And the second one I'll put some silver filler on. I'll let this dry during the time Rich is here. And tonight put on some silver filler. Put it up by the heating vent. I'm just thinking about this, how I can leapfrog along a little bit here. Only because I want to take advantage of this good weather. This weather is, is an unbelievable, a really good thing. Now, there's a couple little tips I learned right away here, and Midgley and, and Rich Oliver can take advantage. Where, where the ribs are in this, I'm trying to avoid going through. I'm trying to be very delicate around it, and I've almost gone through in one spot already, but I'm just being very, very delicate. Now, the last thing, when I get to this point, and I have a whole panel sanded out with the block, I'm taking a part by hand. Now, obviously, you can't do this with a uh, with a rib tissue wing, but one of the advantages we have, in, or if you have a foam wing, is from this point in the job on, you're really home free all when it comes to sanding this out. And I really was trying to plan the day, as I always am, to take the most advantage of things, but I wanted to, to just confirm that on this kind of job, 
I'll always use a sanding block first, get as much of it done. But then as always, and you can just wipe with your hand, candle it, and see a couple little shiny spots, then you have to get in there. Otherwise, you're just going to build up too much material. And the other part is, at the very end of this, I can use one of these sticky back pads. And I'm trying to simulate, especially on a tip, because these Miss Ashley tips are so... They're such a focal point of the plane. I want to do exactly at the very end of it what the air would be doing. Just, just simulate the airflow out off the tip. Boy, if if I was trying to do this job with old-fashioned dope that would take two or three days to dry sometime and then turn to chewing gum. You'd never see this right away the next day. So anyway, we're almost ready. I got one more panel to do, and I want to get set up to spray. Again, it's that efficiency thing, trying to take advantage of a day. We don't usually get these kind of days, but if I can get one or if I can even get some of the silver filler on there today, this can be drying tonight. What a, a, what a joy it is to sand out dope that just turns to powder. It just powders right off. And one last thing, and I don't want to soak it. I want to take some M600 because I did get fingerprints on this in the course of doing it. I don't want to soak it. I just want to wipe whatever dust. And there's plenty of dust. It's all, it, all the dust is winding up in these towels, which at the end of this day, of course, will go right into the laundry. And this will help minimize any spot that Hopefully we're not going to have any fingerprints showing through in the final finish. Now this is going to be, it looks like it's almost 50 degrees out there. I'm so, so impressed. We may be able to get on one nice thin coat of clear. That's the goal. I'm going to try to set the compressor at about 30 PSI. Put just enough retarder in that it'll lay down nice and flat. Because we're not in a rush to get this dry, even if we can't get the silver on today, we'll get it on tomorrow. And while we're working on Rich's plane, this can be out in the garage drying. And Karen will be so happy that we're not stinking up the house today. Ready to spray. Boy, that's a good feeling. We'll just test and see what our mix is like. Again, low pressure, a little extra retarder. See if we're getting a nice lay down on the paint. Let me just take a look at this. And the sun comes out. Can you believe this? Not sure if you can see that on the camera. But that's what we're looking for, is just a nice, a nice flat coat of clear. Now the idea is in this temperature, I could actually leave this outside today, but I'll put it in the garage. This will dry nice and slow. The retarder will let it just lay down, sit there nice and slow. And on top of this, now, and again, this will be a little bit of an experiment. I want to put my silver with a little bit of filler in it. I just, I just think the way this is laying out, the way this fin, each finish is different, of course. I don't think we're going to need a lot of filler. And if we do, we can just hit it a couple extra little spots. I think most of this is going to be very easy to fill as these carbon wings or composite wings, they tend to be very easy to get a nice finish on. There's not much of a trick to getting Brodak Oak to lay down nice. And I hope that's one of the things you can pick up off of this tape for a simple reason. It just makes the sand out that much easier, that much quicker. Now this is looking like it almost could be a flying day. I took about almost, but once once I get involved in and, and psyched up to, for a project like this, or for Rich's project, which I'm psyched up just as much as my own, what happens is I kind of want to put the flying on the back burner, unless it's an exceptional, exceptional, one of those California dreaming days. Boy, that's laying down. And the other thing, cold weather lets the dope dry slower, it lets it lay down better, it gets a better mechanical bond, so up to a point, being in 50 degree weather is just about ideal. Everything's laying down nice, that little extra retarder. You can see we've, we've got almost a little bit of a shine on the finish. We don't have a drop of filler on this plane yet.
no talc at all. And this is a wood part, not a composite part. Now because of the, the, the nice temperature right here, I, what I did, I knocked the pressure down to 20. Just, again, I'll save myself a lot of sanding of brush strokes and overspray and everything. If I can get this to lay down, and it looks like, boy, have we lucked out with a day. It, this just couldn't be better. Look at that sun coming out. Woo! Oh my god, what a day. Now I've been letting this stuff dry up about a half an hour. Ooh, that looks nice. You can always see it has just a nice, I don't know, a nice patina or whatever you want to call it. Got our fan going and when Mike did the roof, we put a fan up in the in the rafters when you put the new roof in just for this purpose because what happens here in in the garage right now the problem is the humidity from the cold air is a real deal breaker it's really cold in there it's a lot colder in there than it is out here and the humidity just totally makes for not good drying time anyway that's going to sit and dry out there and maybe after Richard's visit, if the weather stays like it is, and it's just an incredible day, if it stays the way it is. Hey, if Rich wasn't coming over, I think we'd just go for a motorcycle ride now and say, Hey, Rich, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> it really is. We've really taken advantage of a good day here. It was like a free touchdown. Now we're getting ready to mix up the silver for this year. I want to mix a brand new batch. And luckily for me, I've already given away, I don't know if Brian or John DeTavio or somebody got what was left of last year's silver. Because I have a feeling on this batch, we're not going to really need a lot of talc. But we're not, maybe I'm going to try to put one coat on with no talc at all and just see. Because the stuff is drying up there so well. And after Rich has done glass in his wing, we'll really be in Fat City. But here's where people have a problem with silver. And we've used the silver method for... Well, since Harold Price showed it to me, and I don't know who he stole it from, but I've heard that other people had invented it before Harold. So I guess you're all getting rich on your patents, but again, a nice clean kimchi jar. I'll make a label up for it. I dump in that amount of silver. It's hopefully stirred up, but there's always some at the bottom. Now, the way to get around this, take some thinner. This is one of the ways I've found to, to ensure that you're getting the right mix on your silver and ensure you get all the, the pigment out of the bottom of the can at the same time. I'll stir this and shake it. Pretty much what's going to happen to this now. I'll get most of that pigment mixed into this. Again, the silver method whether you use talc in a silver, the first coat, no talc in a silver, the silver is there to show you the mistakes. Now that pretty much ensures we've got a pretty good 50-50 mix. Now we still have some little pigment at the bottom, so I'm going to just keep stirring along. And because I don't want to change that 50-50 mix, I'll pour it back in some of the thin. This is an important thing to I've even gone so far in the past as to strain it, but if you constantly stir it, and I just get a long screwdriver and just... The gun that you're using for silver, you can put a ball bearing or a nut or a bolt or something in it to keep, keep all the pigment in suspension, because even after an hour or so, a lot of it falls to the bottom of the can. And dealing with this, what it does, it allows you to put less silver on, at the same time, you have to sand less off. All we really want this first coat of silver is to show us what areas are dry and what areas need a little touch-up or some little attention to detail. 
and that would pretty much well what I'll do is just put a, a drop more of thinner in here so I can get that last little bit of pigment out of the can I don't want to I don't want to have it oh there we go and this is the whole now that mix that silver is ready to spray no retarder bottom of the can is perfectly clean I can put the lid on but it's easy just to stir it and I'll set up and test the gun while I'm waiting for Rich to get here so that when he gets here or when I when he's done that clear that we put on this morning should be totally dry God it's up over 50 degrees out there it's an unbelievable day and we'll be ready to shoot some silver all I have to do now is make up my label put the year what the mix is and what ship it was blended for and that'll probably be well if we need more we'll get more but that is that is the best way I know of to find little flaws little mistakes and not have to fill them with colored paint you fill them with silver and at the same time you're shaving down the mountaintops until you have one very nice thin coat on the whole part and what we can do conveniently enough set up the little touch-up gun I'll get this ready and the trick is here is is to get just enough silver on that we can see the mistakes but the first coat if I see a mistake as I'm as I'm spraying and I'll do that when Rich leaves when I see that mistake what I want to do is right away put some extra material in there so I can block sand it all flat and this is the gun I got set up for silver and we'll just have a cup of coffee while we're waiting for Rich here looking forward to working on that stupid this afternoon once he gets here and those labels I find are really important a year later I forget what's in what jar can having the labels on everything really works well for me and it only takes a second to do it Cut it down. Are they windy eyes? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not they yet. look. It, that's the one has to be windy eyes. It will be. Oh, you got to go a long this way is, to windy eyes. That this is carved. Look, look, Rich, Rich, come over to look. Testarossa. Let, let me show you windy eyes. Razor blade. Look. Hold this, that up. This is not there. This yet. looks like you know, it's like not done yet. Bette Midler's nose or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's not done. This yet. is what Joe's talking about. Look, yeah, razor blades. The, 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 uh, <laughs> the trailing edge is much thinner than mine. Look at me. You're, you're a world famous guy. Step one is we get the whole table covered with newspaper. This is going to be a relatively sloppy job. Look at me. Look at that good looking guy there. <laughs> it must be your twin brother, your evil twin brother. Okay, you want to jack it up as just so it's off the table. You may get away with now, nah, you need two. Okay, we're going to put a shirt over this, so don't worry about it. This we just got to make a jig that holds the wing and get it out toward the end of the table here because you're going to want to lean over it while you do it. In other words, you want it over here, Rich. Pull this closer to the table. That's it. Now, okay, now you could work on it. Now take a, one of my spare shirts and just put one on each end and that locks it in. Now you could work because what's going to happen, this is going to rock around like rock around the clock. So you got to get something under here. Get one of these shirt? here. I want this so it doesn't rock. Right, so break it in half. Yeah, break it in half. And just put half under the trailing edge okay. like that. Yeah. You got it? Okay. Now it won't rock. Try to make try to make a jig to hold this. Cause of cause of its unique shape, it's very difficult. Yeah, do the same thing on this one. And then what we do is just lay a towel or a rag or something on each side just to hold that in place. Because we're gonna do these three seams. Let them get a little tacky and sticky, which will be about a half an hour, and then we'll flip it and do the other sides. Okay. You ready? Okay, now you're going to be comfortable working there. Just see if you got... Okay. So the first thing is take some M600 and a paper towel and get all the dust off. We already sanded this. Get all... Here's the M600. Just the spritz you want to get, because in case there's fingerprints or anything on there, and then we got to cut the material. That'll dry up by the time you cut all the material. Yeah, just spray that. That's the deal. Because that sanding dust doesn't do you a favor when you get to the final uh, 
the final issue here. Okay, now, so the first thing we're going to do is take, get the e-glass and we'll cut all the material ahead of time before we mix any resin at all. So I put a, a colored background down so that what Rich could do, you can actually see the cloth better. And you can get it cut to length even. So you want to cut, one to, you want six of each of this size. Six this size, then six just a little bit smaller, and six just like a bandage. Okay, we're going to use the West Systems with the pumps. Very easy system to use. Rich already pre-mixed up a little cup. One ounce, a one ounce mix should be plenty for one side, maybe plenty for the both sides, who knows. And when you think you got it mixed, mix it two minutes more. That's the whole ticket here. Now the reason for laying this out is on the green is you can see it. When you put it on a newspaper here, it kind of disappears. Yeah, yeah, so you get a or a towel or something. Okay, make a stripe. Start on whichever. Now what's going to happen on the valley ones when you go to stretch this out, it's going to pucker up. So you got to You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You've got to take two squeegees and hold one down. And we'll get all the extra resin off. Just for now, just get make a good stripe on there. Now once these stripe once these joints are glass, the tips will be the next step and you got to carved. Well, I got to windy size them. Windy eyes them. Windy eyes them. As world famous Joe Adamusco would say, windy eyes them. Grab the thickest one first. Okay. Now as you work the resin in, start in the middle and work your way out. Start in the middle. You have a squeegee? And the only thing you don't want to do is pick up the middle where this is in the, in the V here. You don't want to have it that it's, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? In the end, you just, you can run that trowel right down the middle. Dennis McNerney. Yeah, what's the deal with the flying field? <coughs> well, I'm waiting for him to get back to me. Oh, all right. Man, I hope <coughs> we're not going to have a problem with that. I don't think so. Because right, according well, to Frank, we're dependent on you because you got the political connections here. Well, I, uh, I'm working on it. I'm telling you. I know you are. Right? I'm getting very anxious. Mm -hmm. Just that? get it to go. That's real good. Just get it to go off the end. Same thing, and then you lay the second piece in there. I lay the second piece right on top of that, the thin piece. See, once you do this kind of stuff and you get a little technique for it. Piece of cake. It's only that first couple times. Okay, now we get. Now the take the thin one. one, yeah. Skinny one. And try to get it half and half on the joint. This is too short, isn't it? No, no, that's okay. It's all right. Pat it down. Try to keep the joint right in the middle. Now try to try to use the same resin that's already in there if right. you can, before you do any more. And then we'll just hit that with a little bit of heat, and you'll see that you'll be able to get almost all of the resin off. You want it to, you know, it, it's capillary. Yeah. It soaks right up. It soaks right up. It's but as right. soon as you hit that with heat, it's going to turn to water. I always like the low setting. Just get it, it you'll feel it getting watery. It doesn't take long. Now just don't pull too hard or you're going to pull it out of place. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That looks pretty good. Let the heat do the work. And the hardest joint to do is a valley joint like that because it wants to pull up on the top. On a mountain top, you just stretch it out. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I think we. Okay, now the last thing, and you could do this three. with your trowel, but I like to do it with my finger. Just push it down. Make sure that it's right. There. Yeah, right. Okay, now the last thing. No, get the alcohol. <clears throat> get the alcohol out of there. No, 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 no. The, the that the dish detergent there. Take a clean paper towel and just put a little bit on there, and do the edges. That'll save you a little bit of sanding. 
See where your end is? Just, right. just don't get it out on the cloth. Just, there, you clean that up. It'll just make, when you tissue it, that joint will just disappear like magic. Okay, now, because you're in a mood to do a valley, I do the other valley. Do that. You, you're already in mode here. And then the last one will do the middle. Do the same thing, basically just a repeat performance there. And you got plenty of time. I mean, it's this this resin gives you a good... This is how many hours again? Oh, this has to dry overnight. I know, but I mean uh, working time. Uh, in this shop, 65 degrees, probably an hour. Oh, I've got plenty of time. Yeah, you got plenty. You may not even have to mix another batch. I don't know. But if it starts getting thick, or you'll know if you leave it in a cup and you mix two ounces, it'll catch fire. You'll be sitting here and all of a sudden you smell something and you're looking no at things on fire. <laughs> all right, just lay it down there. Oh, it's happened to me. You mix more than... More than a very small amount. It doesn't take much. And it's, no kidding. Uh, oh, is it fun. See, the first time you did this, it gets a little intimidating. Like, like it even, even one less than I would do in this. But then very quickly, it gets to be a technique that that's very easy to do and very easy to do over and over again and not have a problem. Well, the Senor Wences might say. Yeah, easy for you, easy for not you. for me. <laughs> Difficult for me. Senor Wences. Senor Boltaco. That guy was good. He was. You know who I always liked on Saturday Night Live? The guy that used to, that Gumby guy? Oh, no, Mr. Bill. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm trying to cross the street. A bus comes by crying. <laughs> oh, no. I'm standing in front of a P-51. Oh, no, Al Raby hits the starter motor. Poink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. you can tell what a mental giants we are. <laughs> what entertains us. All right. Get the second piece going. There you go. See, at some point in time, th this will just be automatic. You won't even have to. Like when you do the nose of the plane, you get all the woodwork done. Glass the whole nose of the plane. Why fool around? And then when guys pick up the plane, you don't get yeah. those fingerprints like in Banjok's plane. Looks horrible with all fingerprints on it. It's not just Banjok, mine too. No, several mine. I'm just using his because his is such a beautiful plane that it looks horrible to see those things there. Okay. All right, and you finish this one up, then we'll do the big guy in the middle. Big guy in the middle is going to get three layers. Yeah, this buddy of mine wanted me to commit myself to ski with him this year. They're going out west again. You tell him you're building a Stuka. I told him. You can't. I you have no I, time for skiing. Put those skis I on committed, eBay. I committed myself to this That's project. Right. I mean, I could have gone flying today. It's such a nice day. I, was, I really thought you were going to call and say, That's the hell I'm with the Stuka. See, now I know you're serious. No, no, you're I a committed gotta, individual. I got I to keep going on this. You got to knuckle down. Well, while this is drying, we'll look at the fuselage, see what else we can do on that. But let's get the... I think it's done here. Yeah. Okay. Dude, that's it. Put uh, your finger no. down the middle. Sometimes you do it with the trowel if you got gloves on. And then wipe the edges. Just clean up the edges with the, with the isopropyl and you're all set. And normally, you know, you'd only have one joint in the middle of the plane to do. But there is, uh, there is no fiberglass on here, on the tip. It won't matter. That on matter. the uh, trailing edge. Well, it won't matter at all. You, okay. Because you're going to tissue this whole way once we get the tips done. Then the next step will be to get it tissued. And once it's tissued and sanded out, then we'll make up the flaps. I just hope you got some decent 3-8 wood if you're going to use 3-8 flaps on this. Well, I hope so. I wish we could make flaps like the real Stuka that had those big hinges yeah, with those little... Yeah. Remember Frank Williams had them? Yeah, yeah. Frank Williams had them on his plane. That guy, I wasn't aware how... Uh, oh, yeah, he's a sharp character. How intelligent the guy is and well-educated. Well, he's got, I think, 15 more years education than I do. <laughs> he's got about 25. <laughs> well, that may, that may be the numbers, too. Okay. Just flip it and put the towels back on to hold it in place. You know, rejig it up. Turn it around. I'd rather have 
the curve in the front. Yeah, okay. that's it. There you go. You want the leading edge. Exactly. Yeah, just flip it. We'll rejig it up in this position, and of course, all you got to do is the same thing on this side. There you go. It's nice holding it with the towels. That's yeah, a good is. way to do it. Use up those cores. Now it's nice and solid to work on. Wipe okay, down. wipe it down. I'll mix up another batch. Now we never try to use the same batch because the, that batch that we threw away is already, what, about 20 minutes old? And it starts to get jello-y also because it's in a mass in a cup. If you fool around too long, it catches fire. And Rich does not even have a fire extinguisher. Yes, I do. <laughs> not through it now. Don't cut. No, no. no. Glass over this. This is yeah. the plug for the landing gear. And I'd say even tissue and dope it when it's yeah. in silver. Then just cut it and cut it through. dig it out. Sure, let it stay so you don't start dripping and drooling mm -hmm. stuff into the wing. Okay, ready to do the bottom? Yep. Got all the glass all cut up on the floor there, all ready to go. Rock and roll. I don't think it took even, even, you know, Sabatino or somebody. You do this once or twice, and it, it's very easy to get comfortable with these techniques. Wait. Now, you've only got one valley here, so this valley is the one you want to do and put a little bit, we'll put a little bit extra around that bell crank mm -hmm. mount too. The top ones are not prone to crack. It's the valleys that, if you lay out the geometry, the geometry on the valley, this is where you got more leverage in a valley than on a peak. All the strain. Just get those hairs if you can. It just saves you time, you know, with the, uh, when you're going to go tissue it and sand it and everything. All right, there shouldn't be much to do here. This ought to be just pretty much the same as the other side. There's the uh, fiberglass matting. See, I don't know if I'm going to be using this header. You better take a little more off. Why yeah. do you even have that? You, you better take that quite a bit down. Yeah, I got to take it off. Because no air is going to go through there either. That's the problem. Well, it goes up. That's the way I got them all. You could go down to where this this here is only a quarter of an inch. Leave you leave a quarter of an inch in a yeah. big radius, but yeah, you but want air going through there for sure. Right down here. I'm gonna and you want to leave yourself the chance to use bigger mufflers, fatter, wider, oh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Whatever you want to do on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to use a head of this the same sword, one. Right? Yeah, similar. Yeah, it's like I got them all made up already. And okay. this this is what I want to do. I want to put some carbon fiber on this. Like yeah, let's have. do that right now. And then I'll put another piece in the back. I didn't put a piece in the back yet because... We'll make the piece long enough. We'll make it in one piece. You want to make it in one piece? Sure. Sure. Get a so piece of wood. So, Rich, what is this, like the fourth shim you're making? <laughs> First, I made one to show him how to make it a nice, tight fit, and it was too small. Then he made one, and it was even worse than mine. And what we're going to do, we got a sheet of Teflon. This is thick Teflon. And we're going to use a carbon fiber mat, a nice thin mat, mix up some epoxy and make a tank shim that's going to get glued in there eventually. See, this one you can glue in because we know you need that shim. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, look. Perfect. I don't believe it. Perfect. Perfect to you is not the same as perfect to me. Perfect. It's perfect. not the same. Easy for you, not for me. I'm going to run out of balsa wood. This is going to be like a $10 tank shim here. 20 So I want you to confess, how many shims did we make? <laughs> Half a dozen. <laughs> Half a dozen. <laughs> we ran out of wood. Okay, now paint that on. <laughs> because this is getting glued in place, you know. This is not just going along for the ride. Spread it. You want it to come right through the other side. And lay that balsa wood right in there, Chicky. Half a dozen shims. Finally, we got one that fits. Finally. Well, it doesn't fit yet until we get this part out. This has to dry overnight. But this will laminate on there. I've never seen a... I've never seen a tank shim I didn't like. 
unbelievable. <laughs> See, but actually what you need this for is when we mount the carbon tank in there, you need right. something hard. You can't have soft balls. No, I know that. It's got to mount to a hard point. When I saw yours, I said, Whoa, oh, yeah, I nice. like that. Huh? I like that. I like it. All right, okay, now. Now, trowel some of that off. Yeah, trowel it, squeeze it through, It's because it's going to come out the other side. And then just lay the balsa wood right on top. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, man. The matador over here. Okay, lay that right in there. Get it nice and even, and then we get something nice and heavy to squeeze on it. What you, what you press it, no, press it down. You could press it whatever means necessary. Yeah. Because even if, when you trim the carbon, you're just going to, Les figured this out, you just trim the carbon with a sanding block. When it dries, you follow oh, through it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can actually use a roller. Let's get a roller on that. Just squeeze it out. Okay, now, let's just put this here. Let's put some weights on it. You want to use Get that something side? heavy. Yeah, no, the, the sandpaper side's flat as can be. All right, just warm it up and then, then press out some more of the resin with this. That'll come out. And put that on with a weight on it, and you're home free all, baby. A precision tank fit in less than an afternoon. I'm so <laughs> impressed. Rich Oliver will be so impressed with this job. And so the tank shim sits there. <laughs> I, I, can't, I still can't believe this guy spent the whole afternoon to make a tank shim. Unreal. Six. Six shims. Shims. Six. Well, believe it or not, we survived another day of working on a Stuka. And his tank shim is drying away. The wing is drying away. The clear on my wing is up by the heating vent. And that beautiful, beautiful day that we just had, it just amazingly turned into a very cold day, very quickly, as soon as the sun went down. But that is one way you can make your own tank shim. And of course, that's going to get epoxied in place and be a good resting place for the carbon fiber tank that will ultimately go in this plane. And we're going to have to make, I'm sure, a little bit different shape than we normally have. But that's coming, just makes one of the more challenging parts of this project. Dave Midgley's mold is making us parts pretty much every day now. We just got them stacked up here, four or five different ones. We tried several different resins, several different ways of making them. But we're coming out with some, actually some pretty nice parts at the end of this. And boy are they light. That's going to be a product in the next year or so we'll have available. We're still waiting for the machine shop parts, but... All of these small production run things, you can't expect the guy to shut a machine shop down to make some spinner back plates. And do we have any exhaust manifolds? <laughs> I don't think so. How many would you like? And I hope this is all working out for you. You're enjoying sharing this adventure with us. Most of all, I hope we'll see you on the next tape. And a lot of cool stuff. I'm going to start carving that. Speaking of cool stuff, that top block, I hope, is going to be perfect, ready to shape now. After all this, it's probably been down there a month. Anyway, it's always a good time to quit when you've had a good day, and today has been a very good one. And maybe we'll get some of this warm weather and we can get some silver shot. See, the, the objective here is, if we have good weather, we'll do dope finishing. If we have horrible weather, we'll carve the top block. And if Rich buys a, a salami sandwich, we'll work on his stuka. A lot of projects, and most of all, a lot of fun sharing it with you. And Walt Russell, from Karen and I, we hope you really bond with Beverly, that, that little cockatiel. I'd like to have a nice big picture of her. Put her right up by Chicky, right up on the wall. What a great thing that would be. Beverly and Chicky together. Now it's the next day, and I wanted to look at how this tank shim came out. We've got this Teflon sheet on each side. 
You see, because of the Teflon sheet, what a nice surface that makes. Now this is going to get glued in to Rich's fuselage. It's got to get trimmed and glued in next time we have a session here. I think he took the fuselage home with him. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's a nice way to make a carbon fiber tank shim. All you need is, if you didn't really have a good sheet of Teflon, the source of it is Dave Midgley that I got, or you could get one from me, of course. But that's a nice way to make some carbon fiber surfaces that way. Good little trick. Anyway, we're coming up on, or well, we are on the end of the video. We need to do another thing is shoot some pictures for Rich Oliver for Control Line World. We need to go over and take a look at how Rich's wing dried up. And, of course, our top block, but... The first thing, as always, is we're at the end of the tape. The beginning is always the end. We end another day, begin another day, and it all comes together when we finally see this. The wing is up there drying up. When that wing, we're going to let it dry a whole nother day here because we have a whole day of shop work. And with an extra day of drying time, that should sand out like butter. And I know Rich is very, very excited about Seeing this wing come to fruition, it's going to be coming to fruition very soon. And we'll see you on the next tape. And needless to say, one of the things, Joe Adamusco is stoked. And whether it's email or telephone every day, there's something regarding the Spitfires. We'll see you on the next tape. The line drawings on the right are a Spitfire stunt ship that is nearly scale. You can see Dave elongated the lower and side view profile. Fuse I suppose the Spitfire is the legendary fighter aeroplane. What is perhaps surprising is that it's absolutely justifiable, it's absolutely delightful aeroplane. Difficult to quantify its value as a fighter, but certainly as an enjoyable aeroplane to fly, it's absolutely tremendous. <laughs> Well, it's sad.